try my best. Anyway, welcome. Uh, I am actually going to give you two talks instead of one, because uh, the second one is the main talk, but I thought it would be nice to give you some background on quantum computation and what, you know, what PL looks like in that sense. Um, okay, let's get started. So, you know, uh, just to introduce myself a bit, I'm a fifth year, heading to sixth year PhD student at UChicago. Chicago. Um, funded by this five-year NSF expedition called EPIC, which stands for, um, <laughs> I believe, I believe it stands for, uh, I don't remember the E honestly, but practical scale quantum computation. Did not practice for that, sorry. <laughs> so well, uh, well, quantum machines are actually here. You may not believe it, but they are. Uh, many people may have heard of this result back in 2019 when Google announced they achieved quantum supremacy. Uh, it's already pretty old news because several other uh, organizations have announced similar results or better results. One of these, which is also quite old now, it's from December 2020 from a Chinese uh, group, which also showed quantum advantage. I don't wanna talk about any details here, but we in the field who are doing this research know that quantum machines are not any hype anymore, even though there's a high associated with them, people have been creating machines and they're getting better every few years. So uh, PL people should start taking attention. Uh, so we have this long-term vision in computer science, at least this is something that was inspiring to me in my undergrad when my professor told me my advisor at the time that, you know, in other engineering fields, there are some guarantees we provide for the things you create, like a civil engineer for a bridge. But in computing science, we just go without any liabilities. And that should over time change to give more credibility to our discipline. Uh, this is preaching to the choir, you all know this already. But in quantum computing, we have a huge opportunity to do that right from the beginning because, uh, you know, classical computing is already the past, but in quantum, we are starting from scratch. Um, and most people may have seen this slide already, so I'll not spend time on it, but there are several ways you can achieve software reliability. And uh, this is a slide from Benjamin Pierce. Uh, and I, my research focuses on the bottom left area where I uh, try to work on, on the more mathematically founded techniques with you know, sound type systems, formal verification, et cetera. And okay, why do we even want to do it in the quantum setting? Uh, or what's challenging about it? So a lot of classical software techniques do not directly transfer to quantum computing. And uh, some of the reasons are that there is a notion of quantum state which, can, which collapses as soon as you try to measure it. So you cannot do debugging kind of, uh, you know, you cannot just run the program and debug it because as soon as you read the qubit, which is, I'll explain what a qubit is, as soon as you read the state, it destroys the state of the program. So that doesn't work. We cannot really simulate uh, qubits, up, uh, I mean, quantum programs up after a certain extent. I think the current computational limit, well, up to 2019 when Google did the experiment, it was about 53 qubits. That was the largest they could simulate. It may have increased up to like 54, 55 by now, but not much. That's not a good number of qubits to do anything practical. So we cannot do that. Then uh, quantum machines are pretty expensive right now. They're unreliable. And if your programs are wrong, you are basically wasting all the time and energy and cost. So it's important that we give the correct programs to the quantum machines. Right. So uh, what my research is focused on is, you know, whatever we can do in the classical setting, uh, whatever we have achieved in the classical setting in PL research, usually, usually static techniques, uh, apply those. And of course, there are some things that are quantum specific that we find along the way. Um, and uh, the last point doesn't apply for today's talk, but uh, if you are doing a formal verification kind of work, then can we bring the techniques closer to programming rather than uh, having it as a separate part of the process? Um, so let's talk a little bit about what quantum computation is. Uh, so this is a one slide summary, so I don't hope to give you good intuition, but at least some uh, terminology that we will use. So <laughs> I'm 
there are four famous postulates of quantum mechanics. Uh, there is a notion of states. So first thing to understand about quantum computation is it can be very easily explained using just basic linear algebra. The notice, the what I'm saying in the slide is all linear algebra. So if you have taken basic linear algebra, you will mostly understand that. But the intuitions take longer to gain, which is okay for our needs today. This is fine. So states are basically unit vectors in a uh, complex vector space of you know dimension n. It's called Hilbert space. And here are two examples. That's the zero vector. This notation is called cat, cat zero and cat one. So these are column vectors. This specific uh, set of vectors is called the computational basis. So for example, when you measure a qubit, you have to choose a basis first. Like uh, there is a Hadamard basis. There is a, there's one more basis, three standard basis, but this is the most common. This corresponds to your usual zero and one bits. That's why it's called computational basis, right? So uh, then a general state vector will look like this, uh, which could be an arbitrary uh, superposition of being zero or one, and alpha and beta are, uh, amplitudes here, which normalize to one. So they define how much, when you measure a qubit, uh, which looks like that psi uh, in the center with probability alpha square, it will come out to be zero in the computational basis or uh, with beta square, it will be one. So oftentimes uh, people represent a qubit like a block sphere, which is shown here. And that just shows you, uh, you know, what a state vector can be. It can be any point on the surface of the sphere. And that all is represented using this single equation in the center. Right. So that state, then how do you modify that state? So the idea is you apply uh, unitary matrices on a given state. So here's a quick example. Uh, we are applying X gate or X matrix, which is represented in the matrix form as this zero, one zero on that state vector above. And the result you notice is uh, alpha one plus beta zero. So what this X gate does, it inverts the state. It's, a, it's called the not gate. So instead of zero, one, now we have uh, probabilities have been inverted between one and zero. So it flips the zero bit to one and one to zero, right? Then we can do measurement as I mentioned. So that just means uh, collapsing the state. And I already described how you will get output one with alpha square probability and similarly for zero. And in the circuit notation, and I'll show you more circuits later, uh, measurement gate looks like this, like a meter. And the uh, left side is showing a quantum wire, or you can think of it as a qubit coming into the gate. And uh, when there are double lines, that means a uh, classical wire. So there are bits coming out, which are classical. So classic zero or one value, right? And then uh, last postulate is about how do you combine systems? So for that, um, you can take multiple um, states, state spaces really where they live and take a tensor product of them. So I'll not show you that, but it just means you can work with uh, multiple Hilbert spaces, right? And uh, now to do all that in, uh, in a computer, in a programming language, you need some primitive commands. So most commonly you will see things like init M, which is like create a new qubit with the value M, classical value M. And then the second one is for applying gates, apply a unitary gate to an expression M. And the final one is measurement, right? Oh, and feel free to stop me for questions, okay? At least for this part, uh, the second one. <laughs> <laughs> so here are some more commonly used gates. Uh, Z gate is, uh, it's, Okay, I, I should have shown the identity gate here, which is just one zero and zero one, which doesn't have a negative. Identity means if you apply it to any state, it will not do anything. It just returns the same state, right? So the Z gate or poly Z gate, uh, it has, uh, it inverts the phase. So it introduces a negative sign. If you had applied it to, for example, this qubit, you will get a, uh, this uh, psi vector, you will get a minus sign here on the 
it's uh, minus one uh, on the second part of the state. So that's Z. Then there's a Hadamard gate, which is commonly used for putting things into superposition. We'll see an example in the next slide. It just looks like this. Then there are controlled gates, which are basically, <clears throat> they look generally like this. So this is a notation for controlled X also can be written like this. So this dot shows you what is the control qubit in a, oh yeah. Um, it's basically defined by nature, you know, that's basically a law, but uh, the, I think the me quantum mechanical reason ultimately is that uh, the evolution of the state should be reversible and unitary gates let you preserve that. Of course, measurement is not that, measurement is not unitary, that just collapses the state, that's not reversible. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so yeah, talking about controlled knot, it basically is, it lets you branch over some conditions, right? So the first wire here, which is marked by this black dot, acts as control. So the meaning of this gate is that if the value of the first gate is zero, then do not do anything in the bottom. But if it is one, then you apply whatever gate is at the bottom. So in this case, it will do the X operation on the second qubit if the first qubit is one. And similarly for control Z, it will apply this gate if the top is one and nothing if it's zero. So, and the one thing to notice in these matrices is, uh, one you notice that as, as soon as we went from a single qubit, single qubit gate to a double qubit gate, the dimension multiply, right? Uh, we have now from a two by two to four by four matrix. I'll, I'll get to your question in a second. The other thing to notice is that these controlled matrices are called block diagonals. <laughs> so in a way they are composed of two different <coughs> uh, unitaries themselves, mm -hmm. which basically define what happens if it was, if the control was zero and what if it was one. So the first uh, block is shown here. This is the identity one zero zero one, which I mentioned, but didn't show. And this is the not gate. X gate, which we saw in the previous slide. Similarly here, this is the identity that is do nothing on zero. And this is the Z gate, which is shown above, uh, apply Z on one. Yeah, your question. Is there a gate that's the same input Can do what on the input? The same input the input. So for example, if you could combine it to the Ps and put in the top left, such that you only have one output for the Ps. Oh, you're saying uh, sort of zap one of the input? I, I didn't really understand. You mean destroy one of the inputs? Yeah. Just... You can do measurement, but uh, it won't be a unitary operation then. Yeah, the, the reversibility of quantum uh, operations is important. So, and there's a law in uh, quantum computing called no cloning, which both tells you that you cannot duplicate a qubit that is branch out, but you can also not collapse them, apart from measurement, obviously. That's different. Okay, yes. Uh, so I guess for the bigger matrices, if we think of the qubits as being stacked up on top of each other. Right, yeah, that's, uh, you can think of this as qubit one, this as qubit two. These are like classical circuit diagrams, I believe. Right. I Boolean circuit diagram. Oh, think of the vector that the matrix is yeah, it will be a larger column vector. So when we saw single qubit vectors, they were two uh, dimension two, right? They will, the other, these two qubits together will form a column vector of size four by one. Yes. Yeah, I think I was confused by the same thing. I think it's because two plus two is two times two. So the basis mm -hmm. here is zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Or uh, the basis becomes uh, z okay. Um, well, you can think of the basis of two qubits separately, or you can multiply them and think of them as a single basis. So, if you <clears throat> in in case of two qubits, the force potential states will be the column vector zero 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 one. Zero zero one zero 
zero one zero zero and one zero zero zero. So all four possibilities of the polynomial. So that's the basis. Right. I was looking for a way to write it. Okay. All right. So here are two examples quickly. Um, Bell state preparation. So Bell state is one of the most common examples people gave of uh, entanglement. Uh, I said entanglement, which is a common phenomena associated with quantum computing. So what's happening here is there are two qubits in the beginning state zero zero. You're applying a Hadamard gate and a control knot, and you obtain this new state called beta zero zero, which can be written out in this notation as uh, cat zero zero plus cat one one with the amplitude one by root two, which is common. So what this state means is if you, and sorry, I'm skipping over some of the details. What this means is that uh, the way to read this is that the first qubit state is zero or it is one. So the, uh, well, when you measure them, it will collapse, it in, collapse into either the zero, zero state or one, one state. That is the fate of these two qubits uh, is sort of tied together. That's what entanglement is about. So um, there is, we don't see the option one, zero and zero, one happening here. That is physically impossible, quantum mechanically impossible. So that's what entanglement means, like a strong correlation, which is not uh, uh, possible to explain in a classical manner. And th these two Hadamard and control not gates get, let you create such a nice example of uh, entangled pair called bad state. So what does it look like in a quantum program? So like, it, this is like a functional programming language syntax. You're not passing any input, so unit. Uh, ignore this QST. I copy pasted this code from my own slides and it's supposed to be a quantum state monad, but no relevance here. Mm -hmm. And then it returns a pair of qubits. And I'm using the tensor notation because that's commonly used in linear logic to represent uh, Linear linearity and qubits follow linearity, right? And as a simple program, uh, you know, initialize the qubit in zero state, assign to a variable, apply this Hadamard to a, and then similarly do something for b, and then apply this control not uh, c not or cx. Those are the two notations used to the pair a b, and then you just return it. So that's your first example of a quantum program. Right. Another famous example is quantum teleportation, which lets you uh, transfer an arbitrary state from one qubit to another uh, using only a bell pair that we just created and two classical bits, which should not be possible, but quantum teleportation algorithm lets us do it. Because this psi, uh, so what it's ha what's happening here is you, you, you have this arbitrary uh, state vector psi here, this gets transported at the bottom to the last qubit with, and it could be any arbitrary alpha beta values, the initial state we saw, alpha zero plus beta zero. Um, so the circuit is here. Uh, we have beta zero zero as input, the bell pair from before, arbitrary state, control not, Hadamard, two measurements. And these wires are showing that these are classical values now. And this notation, it's similar to what we saw here, but being a uh, controlled x being applied on classical value so it has double wires similarly a control c and the program i will not go step through it it's the same you can represent the circuit as a program yes Yeah, that's a good question. It's not cloning actually, because uh, there are no two copies. We basically destroyed this qubit. It's measured out. This is also measured out. We are left with only one qubit at the end. And uh, also, uh, so yeah, whatever initial state this these two qubits were in, they are not anymore. So we have just transferred the information. It's not cloning. Other questions? Oh yeah. Yes. So when you talk about like systems like two qubits, so 
if I understand correctly, the data system is always like one vector, right? One vector in your number of states. And so you say like two qubits, but it's like two vectors. Right, so no, two qubits would be part of the same uh, Hilbert space. Uh, I mean, you can think, you can expand or reduce the size of the Hilbert space as you need, but generally we consider when we talking about a, when we talk about a system or subsystem, we consider that as a single Hilbert space. But then when you combine them, that's a larger Hilbert space. So then I guess when you said two qubits, yeah, some implicit operator combines it to really the one vector. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can combine them. Yeah. You may not always be able to decompose them though. Like the state we saw here, this is a, you know, a two qubit state, which you cannot decompose into because this is an entangled state. But combining is easy. Okay. So that's the end of the basics. Uh, you know, these are some of the things I've worked upon and I will give a talk about that just now things called Gottesman types which is doing more fine-grained typing for quantum specific properties and something called quantum ho type theory where i was trying to do formal verification using type theory for quantum there is no implementation yet and if you want to learn more uh, i maintain this bibliography at the top there's a short link git.io qplp i can also share the slides uh, ACM 6 plan organizes this Planck workshop. The re most recent edit latest edition is in September at ICFP. It was organized at PLDA last year, Popple the year before that. And then QPL is our one of the more uh, long term, longer running conference called Quantum Physics and Logic. And it has 20 years of history of papers in this area. All right, that's all. Uh, any last questions before I switch tracks? Yeah. Um, can you use uh, any, any reversible gates here? I mean, is there any particular advantage to using hollow gate, uh, like inverse uh, reversible gate or hollow gate? Like what, what, um, uh, uh, is, what, what do you need the reversibility for um, uh, in the model? I think reversibility is just the nature of requirement of quantum computation. And uh, about modeling it, do you mean using uh, language primitives or? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, how would you approach that actually? The, the, the um, I haven't personally worked on it, but I know there is work in that area on reversible languages. Uh, there's even a conference called RC, Reversible Computation. So they publish a lot of stuff. It's, not just gets applied to quantum computing, but other areas where reversible computing is useful. I think there was a paper at IC, no, Popple 2021 on some, I forget, polarized types for reversible computing. It was, I know Amr Sabri at Indiana University was one of the authors on that. So they, yeah, I think he has worked a lot on uh, uh, reversible languages. Yeah. I didn't really understand in your two example programs how the lambda abstraction works. Was that over uh, classical or uh, Um, I think that doesn't really matter. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it will vary depending on the language. So I just picked an example from my previous work. In that model, it's different. What I'll show you today, it's different. So it's not a. A uh, big difference. All right, let's switch tracks to the other presentation. I hope it works. Okay, great. So, um, hi again. Uh, <laughs> so, well, this is also my practice talk. I'm giving this talk on Thursday morning um, <coughs> in the actual conference. So, <laughs> Well, th this is also an actual conference, and I'm glad to be giving this talk in person. The other one is virtual. Anyway, so yeah, uh, I've been working on Q sharp semantics for a while. So this is joint work with collaborators Kesha Haitala at Maryland, Sarah Marshall at Microsoft Quantum, and Robert, my advisor at UChicago. Um, so Q sharp, it's a programming language announced by Microsoft in 2017. 
just when I was starting my PhD. Uh, so I got hooked apparently. Uh, so it's a F sharp like domain specific language, but from surface it looks like C sharp, like imperative style language. Um, and the model it adopts is that a quantum computer is your coprocessor. Like people may have worked with GPUs, so, you know, they work as coprocessors. So similar model associated with the classical machine. Couple interesting things about Q sharp are that it maintains a clean separation between what is classical and what is quantum. And they even use different names for uh, what they call callables. So functions in Q sharp are pure, they are classical, and operations are quantum. Uh, it is Algol like in the sense that. <laughs> To me, Algol was a you know, very good example of synthesis of pure and effectful computation in a nice, safe manner. So I think Q-sharp is very much like that. And in this paper, we try to justify that. Um, then we learned about monads and sequential computation and stuff. So quant in Q-sharp, you know, the way you write quantum code is basically monadic and all computation is done by side effects. Uh, the neat features, everything is immutable by default. Not qubits, obviously, but everything else, and support some meta programming using something called a joint and control operations. We saw what control does, and I'll give you more examples. So here's a teleportation program in QSHA, which we saw before uh, in a different language. So in first line, I'm just showing that uh, QSharp is parametric in a gate set, like what kind of unitary gates it supports. So intrinsic is a library that defines very basic gates but q sharp is defined as a very generic language it doesn't pick a gate set which many other languages do and then here's the bottom is the main teleport function takes a qubit for alice one for bob and the message which was the first qubit which is transferred in the protocol i didn't describe that way but the first qubit is called just general message uh, second is alice the third one is bob um, and Alice and Bob share a bell pair, entangled pair. So that's the first step. We create entangled pair uh, by applying header mod and C naught gates. And uh, notice that in Q sharp, we cannot return the qubits. Uh, we can, but uh, in this case, uh, we said it's monadic computation. So uh, you're passing qubits and they are, they are getting modified and only you're returning unit. Because uh, you know, uh, operations state is being modified in place, so the value returned is unit, but qubit is not returned. But it's modified here when you come back, so it's like called by reference. Um, and similarly, we do send message operation by applying a bunch more gates. Do some measurement here. M is the measurement, and. Uh, to decode, we apply the classical operations. So we saw control Z and control X gates. So here you can use it, do it using the if then else construct. So if Boolean one is B one is true, then apply Z gates. So it's same as the circuit we saw before, just to give an example. So um, talking about why do we need to do this work at all? Uh, Again, preaching to the choir here. We, you know, we like nice languages which are easy to, you know, write in, compose, and maintain. There have been a lot of previous examples: TenderNaml, Java, Go, Lambda JS, Lambda Rust. Right. Um, in Q sharp literature itself, uh, Bettina Heim, who uh, is one of the chief developers of the Q sharp uh, compiler and language as well, she did her PhD thesis recently, and this is one of the design principles she says that it's a evolving language. And uh, we think our work will help evolve it in a better manner with better features. So uh, the general recipe we follow in this work is uh, the same as what people did for standard ML. Uh, Bob Harper will tell you more, but uh, I, I learned a lot from him. So the scheme is you define a well-behaved internal language and well-behaved means you will want all the nice properties you expect from a nice language, like good scoping rules, all the type information that you can find. Um, so we do that. It, that's called Lambda Q sharp in our work. Then you can define a relation uh, from the external surface language to this internal language. And then you can do the, all the meta theory on the core internal language. And the reason this works 
uh, well is because uh, you know it, it uh, according to Bob Harper at least this is the only technique that scales for specifying languages because uh, you're working with a nice abstraction of the actual language and everything else is taken care of from the translation right so we know what type systems do and what dynamics does plus uh, the other thing we can do is we can study the consequences of extensions and variations on the original language. And that's part of what we are doing in our work. Um, so here are some motivating examples, which currently passed by C sharp type tracker and are considered okay, but they are invalid programs. So <laughs> somebody asked about qubit cloning, right? So yeah, so here is an example which Q sharp allows. This is a syntax for creating a qubit in QSharp, uh, Q1. And then there is a pure let command, which lets you make a copy. So this is, a <laughs> this is uh, one way you can make a copy in QSharp. And then if you apply C0 on the same qubit twice, that's wrong because um, you're sort of branching out on the same qubit. So this is totally invalid. Did somebody have a question here? No, okay. Uh, so they should be rejected statically in our, in our understanding, right? And here's the other program where this qubit being created is immediately returned, but uh, uh, if lexical scope was a thing in QSharp, this would have been uh, rejected. I mean, it's a thing, but it's not enforced by the compiler. So it's uh, type system doesn't really do a good job right now. So in our work, we'll show how we can avoid that. Is the basic calculus. Uh, I'll not show you everything. The in interesting thing in the grammar of types is that we have a specific type for qubit references. The qubits you saw are really qubit references, but they are indexed by this uh, uh, orange symbol called Q, which represents every unique qubit in the program. And there are functions, there are commands, command types, there are product types, booleans, and units. So, um, yeah. And this notion of indexing a type with a particular value leads, uh, this is the idea of alias types from 2000, which itself is derived from singleton types. So the idea is that uh, with, with this kind of type, you can track uh, if there are aliases of a reference and a singleton type means it will only contain a single value, which would be corresponding to the original qubit, okay? Uh, expressions are not worth looking at. I've just included them for completeness. Just to, there are lead minings, application, uh, abstraction. There's encapsulated commands because we have a separation between a classical language and the effectful quantum language. Then there are tuples and some values for you know basic types. And here are the interesting quantum commands. Oh. There is the monadic return and bind, which you will expect in a monadic language. And there are quantum specific things. So there is, how do you create a new qubit? In our case, it will be a new qubit reference. There are gate application commands. So this is the usual apply u that we saw before. And there's this special diag app, which actually represents all the controlled gates that you can apply. Uh, sort of the block diagonal that I was showing you, which corresponds to this command you can measure uh, and again the different thing we are doing here is we make sure that the scope of a new qubit is bound syntactically in the command itself so uh, it's then very easy to enforce uh, algol like stack discipline in, uh, for the memory here are some quantum commands uh, let's understand this judgment first so there's the usual gamma but there's also this signature, which I'll explain. So, <coughs> so this is, <coughs> uh, this shows the type of the value written by a execution of a command. Um, so, right. Uh, so the only interesting thing to note here is that apart from uh, the context gamma, M can also depend on things in the signature sigma, okay? And in our case, this signature only keeps uh, qubits. So sigma comma Q, sigma comma R, uh, well, that's not shown here, but it will only contain qubits. We don't 
keep track of anything else. So I'll, I'll show some of these rules in detail later, but here is the usual way you create a qubit, uh, you create a new binding for binding X, which will get added in the context gamma, but also there's a signature extension that will happen when you create a new qubit because you create, I mean, a new qubit symbol is required and add it to the signature. And uh, when you return from the command M, this Q is returned back, that is it's destroyed. So you get the original Sigma back that makes your automatic management of qubits. Right. Um, then there are commands for gate application, which it, so the only thing to notice here is that this, these two rules uh, for gate applications require that each of the qubit symbols QI is unique. And that lets you, uh, and this uniqueness can be tracked using our singleton type that I mentioned. Um, so each I is required to be different. And here each uh, RI I is required to be different. And uh, for diagram, even acts as the control qubit. So we are also saying that this Q should be different from R. So all of these qubits are supposed to be different. Measurement is pretty trivial. Uh, let's see that example uh, we saw before. We can write it in our language as this, uh, create a new qubit, return the output of the following command, which has a let expression, which makes a copy, Q2 is bound to Q1, and then it executes this command diagram, which is this, right? Oh, uh, but then C0 gets written as I2 comma X, and that's just, we did some desugaring or sugaring here because C0 is this, it can also be written as a block diagonal like this. I2 being the identity, identity matrix of dimension two and the XK, okay? So what happens now is that uh, in our type system, not in QSharp, uh, Q1 and Q2 have the same type because the singleton, uh, the symbol associated with both of the variables is Q1. So this rule will be invalid. You cannot apply it and you get a type error. And that's all, this is very, very easy. Um, and then the other property we show is that you can also discard these kind of programs where uh, you are you know, returning a qubit outside of its lifetime. This is, we already saw the rule. Uh, if we try to uh, parse this program where you're just saying, create a new qubit and return it immediately, you will be able to type check the uh, red X only inside the, in the premise of the rule, because that's where the symbol Q exists, but not in the conclusion. And that's just how we have defined it. So you can remove that possibility as well. Um, that's mostly it. This is a supposed to be a 20 minute talk and I've taken a, lot, a 10 minute talk and I've taken a lot of times, but uh, yeah, uh, there are more details in the paper, but future steps are in Q sharp, the more interesting and challenging problem is to deal with arrays and the techniques, type theoretic techniques, like what I showed does not, they do not work with arrays because they have dynamic size. Yeah. Well, quantum lambda calculus is a research language. I mean, in research languages, everything is easy. Uh, it is, I, well, okay. First of all, there are different versions of quantum lambda calculus, but my understanding is all of them are linear. Q sharp is not linear and lambda Q sharp is not linear. Um, no, because uh, from usability perspective, linear languages are very hard to use. I am not aware of any language in production. <laughs> Rust is not linear, it's a fine. Yeah. yeah. True, and, and that's a very interesting observation. And uh, our claim is that the monadic interface here is enforcing that linearity requirement. Yeah, because there is a level of indirection that's happening. You're not working with qubits directly, which, which hold the linearity property. We're working with references to qubits. So that level of indirection and monadically sequentially composing them lets you not run into issues. 
the mistake that Kishab does is letting you make copies of those references, which is where, where our work comes in to improve the language. Yeah. Yeah, I think not. And that, that's why I, I feel like, you know, what we did in this work was very, very classical in nature. It doesn't seem like there's anything interesting happening from for this audience, but for QSharp people, it's very interesting. Uh, let me actually finish this slide because this uh, last page has a summary and then we'll come back to questions. So yeah, just arrays are, oh, actually I don't really have much to say here. There's some future work and uh, there are some more details in the paper. We learned about equational theories a little bit today. So we actually provide equational semantics for a fully complete version of uh, equational theory for quantum computation and there are elaboration rules. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the approach a lot of industrial languages are taking, which are mostly all Python libraries, including Qiskit. Microsoft's approach, and again, I'm not, I don't work for Microsoft. I don't get any funding from them. I did do internship with them two years ago, but that was before this work. Uh, my understanding is, is they iterated through several different versions of quantum toolchain. They've been doing in this business for a long time. And this is what they came up with as their best solution for their needs. And I, I agree as a programming languages person, because you can provide language specific features, which are not possible in Python libraries. Um, Yep, yep. Yeah. And uh, I guess if you want to introduce some other existing content application, Silk or whatever tool you have. Silk, yeah. Um, also it's, Python. It's, yeah, it's difficult. Um, I mean, at some level, your concerns are valid, but some level they're not, because ultimately to run quantum machines, you will run programs, you do need to translate to a lower language, even from Silk or Silk, right? So that's where they interface. But also, uh, Microsoft, they are doing a lot of work on uh, moving to LLVM-based infrastructure. So I think your concerns will go away in another two years. You, you were raising your hand. Oh, yeah. Just wondering if, um, what kind of language features are hard to reconcile with the constraints of the application? For example, I, I don't know if you have polymorphism in the language, but there is, there is limited polymorphism. We, in our initial work, we didn't address that. And I mentioned some metaprogramming features in the beginning, uh, something called like joint and control. So controlled is addressed through the diagonal construction we had. At joint, we have not addressed yet, but we are extending the work and we will address that too. But there yeah. are there generally other features that you feel uh, might be difficult to integrate in the quantum setting or in the quantum setting? Um, well, the Q sharp also supports automatic generation of controlled gates and adjoint gates. Adjoint means reversing the gate, basically. So doing that automatically is definitely hard. Uh, sometimes they use heuristics, and uh, at least so far, I've not tried to incorporate that in my work. That's at a formalism perspective, it's also hard. And then there are certain other correctness properties that are hard to ensure in quantum setting. Like when you when you delete a qubit, like uh, is it safe to do it? Because if it's already entangled with some other part of the system, there is, uh, you know, you just don't want to drop it right away. You need to make sure it's restored to a certain state. Those things are pretty hard to ensure. I think they're not possible using just a type system. You need, um, you know, some sort of solver to ensure those kind of things. Yes? Uh -huh. 
the different rules that have some sort of safety like every sound, or is there some sort of guarantee that you have to say it's different for? Uh, for these rules? Um, I have not formally proved them sound, but uh, by construction, they are sound. <laughs> there is nothing really difficult going on. There is no iteration going on. Right? This is a very, very simple language right now. Uh, I think the, it will be more interesting to deal with those issues once we add arrays, which is what we are working on right now. Um, yeah, the, the idea is somehow encode, uh, you know, identities of qubits in an array, because yeah, you're right, they, they won't have a single type anymore if you just put singleton types. So we encode that in some way and then make sure all the operations that are performed on them are, they don't mess up. Yeah. It's, it's a hard problem. We are trying to use SMT solvers there. Because it cannot be done just using type theoretic techniques. I've tried for a year. <laughs> it doesn't work. Say that again. Dependent types work. I mean, we don't want dependent types in the language, though. Um, well, there is a certain level of complexity that is acceptable to. Uh, general mass, you know, audience, which will be the users of QShark. And uh, I think the dependent types are sort of a non-starter from that perspective. Yeah. Oh, you mean for quantum computers in general? Well, a very factorial algorithm, Schwartz factorial algorithm is considered one of the biggest examples, like the killer application of quantum computing, but that's decades away still, because for that to be practically used, you need thousands of qubits, tens of thousands of qubits actually. So those things are far away, but I think currently people are doing uh, things like some sort of uh, molecule simulation and some sort of machine learning stuff, which I don't understand, but there are some near-term applications for which uh, people are putting money in and trying. Okay, I don't wanna take away all the time. So if there is any last quick last question, I'll answer that and then. Well, the side effect is, you know, uh, shooting lasers on a qubit, physical okay, so qubit, like modifying the state. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can think of it as classically writing into a memory. Right. So it's like quantum state modification is the effect. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.